All right, we've got 10 o'clock. So we've got everybody on the board except Janine, who should be joining us after having just received the invitation. Um, and Melinda is joining us as a guest, thank you, as well as Francie. And to the board members, I want to say thank you for figuring out you were missing an invitation, putting things aside, rearranging your schedule and being here. Your commitment is just great. I appreciate it. So we have um, taken that. We have welcomed our guests. Do we have anybody that wants to make a comment right up in the beginning as public or we can talk about new business? We're good. We can move on to last month's minutes. Does anybody have corrections or notations? I do. It looks like we double posted uh, under old business two. C and H are the same. We could probably eliminate one of them. Okay, Sheila. And then just one other, I have a question. Under reports, Roman numeral four, on the first line, it says Janine reported that there was a discussion of ire. I don't know what that was supposed to be. I don't think we discussed ire. So maybe you could just check with her, Sheila, and find yeah. out how that could be corrected. Yes, I can't think of anything it could be. I will talk with Janine. So otherwise, as corrected, I motion that we accept the minutes from last month. I'll second. Thank you, Art. So now we're moving on right along to item five, old business, and we've got a presentation of the senior support services. Hi, that is uh, myself and Melinda. Amy, I think was gonna try to join us, but maybe she's not able to this morning. Okay. Um, we've got Ziggy Piggy here helping as well. Hello, Ziggy. <laughs> Brandy, um, let me just, just for the board to understand, we call our support services team our four resource specialists and our counseling positions. So right now that's Brandy as our uh, counselor, Melissa, Amy, Veronica, Melinda, who's housed within the LHA buildings. Um, and soon we will have another counselor. So that support services team will um, hopefully be six people soon. So we just have a, a par portion of them today. So. Brandy, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks. Okay. Um, you know, we particularly wanted to have Melinda here today because Melinda is our resource specialist who doesn't serve the entire community, who serves three specific housing communities, um, the Hearthstone, the Lodge, which are senior housing sites with the Longmont Housing Authority, as well as the Suites, which is a mixed property. There are... Um, Melinda, you'll have to tell us how many older adults there. There are quite a few, um, but there are also younger folks. Right. I think, you know, I, I actually don't have my list in front of me, but I think I calculated it was close to 30 percent, 55 and over, even, you know, and then 60 and over. So it's a significant portion of the uh, population here at the Suites. And so, you know, our statistics here really um, encompass all of our work, the five of us. 
Um, and a lot of this data is covering more of what Melinda, Veronica, Melissa, and Amy as resource specialists do. Uh, but I also provide some case management um, in addition to the counseling work that I do. And I work with a lot of family caregivers on trying to connect them with services and resources. So this reflects some of my work as well. So I'd like to dive in and share some statistics. Um, I'm gonna invite Melinda to jump in at any time to talk about how that might look a little different specifically in her work with the Housing Authority. And what I'm really curious about um, at the end is what you all might think is missing, what you, what you might wanna hear about that you're not hearing in our statistics that could help you and others understand the story of the work that we do. So I'm gonna dive in, please feel free to ask questions at any time. And again, Melinda, feel free to jump in anytime as well. Uh, we served 704 new individuals in 2021, folks we had not met with in the past at the Senior Center, which is outstanding. That's a lot of new people for us. Uh, we served a total of 1,142 individuals through those information referral, case management services. Um, our system doesn't break down how many individuals separately just accessed counseling and not those other services, but I estimate it's another, you know, about 10 to 15 people probably. Uh, we helped 334, or we had 334 contacts for caregiver assistance. So these are family members or friends taking care of someone in their lives. Um, looking for all manner of resources. For short-term short case management, we had 156 contacts. For information and referral, you know, this is really our big Randy, one. Randy, Michelle's got a question oh. or comment. Yes, Randy, Randy, if you could just do a quick on the difference between contacts and individuals. Sure. So for the caregiver statistics, we had 334 contacts, but it was 210 different persons. Yes. So as Brandy talks about contacts, that's a, an email, a phone call, a meeting, and an individual is our unduplicated um, numbers. So Brandy, as you go through, just maybe point that out where that's more um, important, perhaps, or more impactful. Thanks. Gotcha. Um, for information and referral, people who are really just trying to get connected with resources, uh, we had 1,900 contacts with 887 individuals. That is truly the brunt of our work. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit soon about how that breaks down and how many times people contact us. Uh, for paperwork, we had 524 contacts with 304 individuals. But I have a strong feeling, and I want to have Melinda say something about this, um, that that statistic doesn't really capture the amount of time and energy that goes into helping people with paperwork, especially if they are Spanish speaking, but also if they're English speaking. <laughs> right. I mean, we're so a couple of things I want to say. So these statistics, I think, are going to look a lot different next year because um, they, they only captured a small portion of, of my time having come on at the end of September. Um, and now that I think residents of the properties are more, more used to my presence, they're accessing me more. There's a lot of people that just, in my case, they just pop by. So they have to make appointments when they're seeing the, the specialists that are at the senior center. But in my case, they're popping by and they may just get something in the mail don't understand it, want me to take a look. So that's that's a little piece of just paperwork. Um, frequently I'm helping them, for example, get their statement of their social security benefits for their rent. Um, so we're, we're making a phone call to, the, to social security. We're following up on an application for food benefits or um, long-term care Medicaid. There's, there's the paperwork that I'm doing with them that's just kind of, you know, can be anything that comes in the mail or that they've been given that they don't know how to fill out to then our own paperwork documenting it. So it's, it's, it's kind of hard to capture sort of how much really paperwork, you know, we're doing. But I know in my case, there's, there's just navigating 
uh, public benefits or just anything, you know, they'll get something in the mail that is a solicitation, is it important? Do I need to pay attention to this? Do I need to respond to it? And then for our Spanish speakers, I'm one of the bilingual resource specialists. Sometimes they're, they're getting things that aren't even in Spanish in the mail. So I'm helping them read them, understand them. I do have a, quite a few clients with some literacy challenges as well. So just helping them understand what they have. When I, was I just oh. want to add to that, and Brandy, I know you have an example you're going to share. I think that's helpful. But also, especially during COVID, paperwork sometimes meant doing things online for people because there was no hard copy paper anymore. And individuals who struggled with paper or struggled with technology, sometimes paperwork was actually walking people through an online paper. It's a good point process. So go ahead, Brandy. When I filled in um, for Melinda's position at the Housing Authority last year, I had one very eye-opening experience helping someone with paperwork to pay for medical equipment where we were applying for grants from various agencies to get some medical equipment that she needed that Medicaid wouldn't cover. Um, and it took hours upon hours <laughs> to do that paperwork. And I actually got help from other staff, Amy and Melissa, um, and it, it really was a shining example to me of the amount of time that Amy, Veronica, Melissa, Melinda need to spend doing paperwork to help people get the resources they need, and then helping people understand paperwork, helping people fill out paperwork, answering follow-up questions from grant agencies. It's just very, very intensive, um, and especially so for our Spanish speakers is what I hear from the staff. But the interpretation of forms and trying to help people understand them brings a whole other level of really case management need around paperwork. Uh, the volume of time we spend with people is really interesting. And I wanted to point out a little info there. Um, the majority of folks we work with, we have contact with once. They've got, you know, a straightforward resource question. We meet with them, we talk to them on the phone, we handle that. So about 559 individuals only talked with our staff once. Another 436 individuals had two to four contacts with us. 114 people had five to 10 contacts with us. And then there's this chunk of 30 people who we met with between 11 and 30 times. So when we meet with somebody 30 times, think about that. That's almost once a week. <laughs> that's, that's at least every other week. Um, and the way we enter our notes in our system is if we talk with somebody more than once in a week, we combine those into just one note. Um, so there is a small group of customers who we meet with really intensely. They need a lot more time and energy and it's not just that kind of one or two shot thing to get their needs met. And in, in my case, being housed in the properties, I'm seeing the clients probably more frequently because they can just pop down and access me. Yeah. Jill, have a question. Question. Yes, Sheila. Um, Randy, how many did you say uh, are the, the, the small chunk is it, that um, you see once a week, perhaps? How so, many people are, are that, is that? There, there were 30 people who we yeah. met with between 11 and 30 times during the year. I thought you said 30, but it yeah. seemed like a lot. Thank you. Sheila, for the sake of the minutes, I actually have Brandy's report in written form. So I can um, share that with you and Prudence after the meeting. Oh, good. Good. Thank oh. you very much, Michelle. Thanks, I'll put Michelle. my pen down for now. Uh, the way we contacted people, and you've got to bear in mind here, the Senior Center didn't reopen until May, and we weren't fully reopened until September. Um, we had almost 1,500 phone calls with 764 individuals last year. Um, we really learned that we could get a lot done over the phone that we did not think we could. Um, I would say the majority of our customers really prefer face-to-face -face contact and, and kind of crave that. And uh, Amy, if you want to jump in with any experience there, please feel free now that you're joining us. 
Yeah, sorry, I had an appointment that ran late. Um, but uh, with that, I, I think part of what ended up happening during the pandemic was we would do a phone call, but then we'd be helping with an application that required a signature. So a lot of times the phone calls turned into a, a drive, drive up where they came to the senior center, we'd go out, get a signature, um, and then process or send in applications. Um, so we found we couldn't do everything over the phone, but a lot of the initial stuff we could. So despite that closure, we still had 774 contacts with 432 individuals face-to-face. -face. I wanna talk a little bit about the, the big issues that we were working on. So we've got, we've got an at-risk category in our data set where we capture really, really difficult things folks are dealing with. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a few of those. We helped 45 people avoid eviction last year. That is huge. Folks who have actually gotten some sort of eviction notice and we help problem solve that and we're able to avoid them being evicted. Um, we worked with 54 people who were homeless when they walked in the door. We were able to help 93 people obtain affordable housing. So some of those folks were homeless, some of those folks were housed, but not affordably and needed to make a change to get more affordable housing. Um, we worked with 48 people who were able to maintain their housing. Um, so this may have been that we helped them with paying rent after they had a medical crisis or you know, they needed for, for, it's usually very short term, like one month to redirect their funds to some crisis in their life. And we made sure they could get their utilities or their rent paid so that they didn't end up getting the eviction notice. That's really important work. We also worked with 55 different individuals who clearly had cognitive concerns. Um, so some sort of dementia symptoms doesn't mean they were necessarily diagnosed with dementia, but typically what happens when we work with folks who have cognitive concerns is uh, it takes a little more work. Sometimes those are our short-term case management clients who need a little more handholding and time and attention to solve the problems in their lives that they're trying to solve. The very big issues that people came in for last year, our number one was financial assistance. Number two was housing. And, and primarily this is people seeking affordable housing, but also like we said, we worked with 54 folks who were homeless. Uh, the third biggest issue was caregiving. So caregivers who are stressed and seeking emotional support or who need to bring in new resources in their lives to make those caregiving situations more manageable or to find something like assisted living or skilled nursing if they can't keep doing the caregiving at home. Um, we do keep track of folks who are coming in and reporting abuse situations to us. And the number one kind of abuse situation we were dealing with in 2021 was financial exploitation. And those numbers are not huge. It was 10 people um, who were being financially exploited. But those cases also tend to be those that need a little more time and attention to help people get proper resources. Um, and we, we have a category of self-neglect. So it's not that someone is abusing, neglecting, or exploiting you, but that it seems you are no longer to meet your basic needs, typically because of some sort of cognitive concern. And we worked with 14 people who seem to be experiencing self-neglect. Often in those cases, we will end up calling our friends at Adult Protection and seeing if we can work together to help people stay housed safely in the community and get the services they need. Um, for caregiver needs, I wanted to give you kind of just the, the top needs caregivers were asking about. Home care was number one. We had 209 contacts with 155 people to try to get home care in place. Respite, which is usually a part of home care, but can, can be different. Uh, 101 contacts with 70 individuals. Uh, and then we had 79 folks we referred to caregiver support groups, or I'm sorry, 79 contacts with 67 people referring to support groups. And why that number is larger, like why it would be that 67 individuals would need 79 contacts is that sometimes we have to talk about support groups more than once before somebody really says, yeah, okay, I think it's time <laughs> that I try that out. And sometimes we refer people to support groups and they are not at all interested, but six months later, 
they say, oh, okay, I think it's time for me to get that kind of support. Uh, from our counseling world, I have uh, just a few statistics I wanted to share. We had 355 sessions with 49 individuals for counseling. So that was offered by myself. I'm a licensed professional counselor. We had an intern getting a master's degree in counseling. And we have our peer support team, who, if you're not familiar, are older adults who meet with other older adults to provide support. Uh, we had 156 sessions for a support group for 42 individuals. So some of those individuals were in those groups together, right? That, that support group session number looks really high, but what it means is we were able to serve 42 individuals, some of them repeatedly many times in support groups. Folks will often come to support groups um, for eight weeks at a time, if it's our grief support group or adjusting to life's changes, or if it's a monthly caregiver support group, they will come every month. We spent uh, quite a bit of time last year referring people to other counseling resources because when we opened back up um, as the pandemic was sort of shifting last April, May, people started to come out of the woodworks um, looking for counseling support. And many of them very specifically wanted or needed to work with a licensed clinician. So I ended up referring 37 people to mental health partners, 18 people to a group called A Wiser Mind who specifically work with folks who have cognitive impairment, uh, 37 people to private referrals. So I keep a list of therapists in the area who work through Medicare and are licensed to be able to refer folks to. And that's kind of outstanding for us. I don't think we've ever made that many outside referrals before. And it was simply because the need became quite overwhelming. I still have a wait list. I, I've often had a wait list over the years, but my wait list has gotten so long in the last year that I've had to close it. Um, which is why we are hiring a second counselor. Yay! <laughs> We're going to increase our ability to meet that need. Ooh. Sorry, that's the flooring. So while Brandy has flooring, I want to just add in that. Um, we are one of the few agencies that does case management. So over the years, lots of nonprofit agencies have stopped offering case management services. So we typically focus that service for a low income or and or unsupported individuals, folks who really don't have family or friends who can help them navigate um, systems and services. So um, last year, um, we had 170 contacts with 46 different individuals. And that's often very time as well as um, time intensive and also usually very complicated uh, situations. Um, some of those um, individuals have been referred to us. Actually, we're getting more referrals from the city of Longmont co-responder team as they are out and about with police um, and responding to situations, the Longmont co-responder model is really a triage uh, sort of approach. And if they're an older adult, they often refer those folks to us for information referral and at times case management. So that's a, a service I think somewhat unique to us. And we are also very mindful, it could quickly overwhelm us. So we're cautious in our approach, but we are not, um, but we, but we do it, um, but we're just very mindful of what case management needs. Brandy, are you ready? She wrote okay. in, the, um, in the chat uh, and just said the top reasons people entered counseling were conflict with family, grief support, and then caregiver support. So, and I was just gonna jump in, um, we, we as a resource specialists and Brandy and Michelle all got together at the beginning of the year to talk about this data and say, just look at what's not reflected in these numbers. Um, and, and we really figured out that there's a, a, a level of intensity and Brandy might have talked about this before um, I hopped on with our Spanish speaking cases. 
that doesn't really get reflected in our numbers. Um, and then the other, other pieces that don't necessarily, they're more of our philosophy or how, how we resource specialists tend to operate is that if there's an urgency or someone that's needing our support, we tend to squeeze them into our, our um, schedules. And sometimes that pushes off our data entry. Um, and so sometimes our, um, the data, we try to keep it as up to date as possible, but sometimes it doesn't always reflect um, exactly because we really are client centered first. Um, so we put seeing the client before putting the note in and we're working on that balance. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. I was able to catch that. <laughs> are, there, are there any thoughts folks have about kind of what's missing in telling the story of our data? How, how often was transportation a problem or an issue? Can you hear me okay or is there too much noise? Okay. Um, for transportation, it looks like we had a total of 128 contacts about transportation. So it, in conjunction, I didn't give you numbers for those top um, concerns earlier. We had 2,000 contacts for financial support. We had 1,000 contacts for housing. <laughs> so transportation was very small in comparison. So it's probably important to just put some parameters around the transportation question, Sheila. So during COVID, um, there was a reduction in some transportation needs because um, folks didn't necessarily, they were making different choices about the beauty shop or this, coming to the senior center or that. But I think what VIA did and, and other transportation providers is they really prioritized a COVID-related transportation. So transport to vaccines, to testing, et cetera, delivering groceries. Um, so they kind of changed up. It'll be curious to see how that goes going forward as we open back up and maybe folks are gonna return to their former or more like their former model. Um, one of the growing transportation issues that we have seen, we don't have numbers, it's kind of a tickler in our head, is the number of folks who need transportation to a healthcare site and need someone to accompany them. So you all may know you go for a colonoscopy, you, and I just did cataract surgery. You got to have somebody who's sitting in the waiting room ready to drive you home. And so that health transportation piece is probably something going forward that's going to be more on the radar for us and for transportation providers. Cultivate um, has had a program that's been a good one, but it's a reliant on volunteers. So transportation is kind of um, emerging again, and we'll see where that takes us, but a great, great question. And I, I'm seeing it already in uh, the Hearthstone and the Lodge, I'm getting more requests for help with transportation as VIA is apparently struggling to accommodate everyone. I'm getting more folks coming in telling me that they're calling VIA, but VIA doesn't have availability. So um, it's definitely increasing. Janine? You're muted. I also um, am aware of the amount of time that may not necessarily be documented that you all spend on the phone contacting people, getting them to apply for lotteries, getting them to uh, apply for openings at, a diff at uh, different affordable housing uh, facilities when they open up their wait lists. And that's time that isn't even really counted that is ongoing and that you do a beautiful job of. Another transportation thing to throw out is the IntelliRide, which is the Medicaid um, non-emergency transportation to medical appointments. Um, I have clients that are coming in 
asking for my help scheduling their ride because they're they're low income already. They may have a data plan on their phone without a minute, a lot of minutes. And those calls can sometimes take up to an hour of waiting to just get an answer and schedule. So And just adding on the transportation piece, some of our data too might reflect it. When we talk to people about transportation, it might end up being more than transportation. So there's an over overlap between transportation and home care. So like if someone's looking for a ride to a colonoscopy, it's talking about what's your support system. Um, if you don't have someone that can drive you, can we get you connected with um, a home care resource and what would that look like? What are your finances? So, and that's where it's hard when we check boxes on a data entry, um, we, we could end up checking five different ones because it turns into a conversation that doesn't fit into just one resource category. A question, do we, uh, I mean, are we making any home visits as well? Yeah, sure. we never stopped doing home visits during the pandemic. We just made some policies around how to do them safely. Um, and we really try to keep home visits to individuals that um, can't get to the senior center or there's programs we do that require in home visits that we go to, so. Yeah, because that can be difficult with the number of people the needs that we have. And I, I commend the, the staff for all they're doing uh, to meet the needs of, of, of our community. Uh, my question is, are we uh, breaking this down by ethnicity, by any chance? We have that data in our system when, when people share that data. Um, we have a data point in our system where we track um, language preference. So we, we can pull some reports on that data, but because we don't always have it, it, it isn't fully accurate, if that makes sense. And, and how many of the uh, resource specialists are bilingual? Three. Three, wow, that's great. And, and again, Amy's working on her Spanish and I work on my Spanish. <laughs> again, I commend you for all you're doing. Excellent. Wow. So, Sheila. Uh, just a, a comment, not a question. Um, sometimes statistics are very um, ordinary and dull, but listening to all of those statistics that you shared today, Brandy and Melinda, I am I am just as art was really amazed at the work that you do, and I'm very thankful that I live somewhere where there are people who do this. I, it really is amazing and worthy of, of Congratulations to everybody. Thank you. And and thanks to City Council for giving us more staff these last couple of years. We've needed it. And, and um, I just want to do a shout out to Janine because uh, she is our resource volunteer and um, she has offered immeasurable help. And some of these statistics actually reflect the work she has done. Um, in um, doing follow-up, making calls, and helping people with LEAP and various paperwork. Um, so it really is a, a huge team when you factor in Janine as well as our volunteer peer counselors. Um, and the other piece that I think um, Brandy didn't really speak to or anyone is our front desk staff um, make the vast majority of all the appointments for Melissa, Amy, um, and Veronica. And so um, that has um, streamlined things for our resource specialists, um, but it also means um, our front desk staff do an awful lot of work to support what, um, what we're doing and um, in the back sort of, you know? So it's a definitely a team, a team effort for sure. Marsha? Thank you. Um, I would just like to say, uh, City Council would like to take credit for those positions and everything, but really the credit goes to the senior center itself and to, in, uh, in large part, to the competent and relevant data that you're collecting because that makes it so much easier 
to justify the need. So, um, you know, a lot of times we get the answer for, from other supplicants for money, right? That, well, we can either choose between doing the work or publicizing the data, you know, and you have ab obviously managed to do both. And that's one of the reasons why you're so effective. So, you know, all, all of, of, of the merit is, belongs to the senior center and to this board. You're so effective. Thank you, Marcia. And, and we as staff talk kind of regularly about what do we need to do to have time to do the data pieces because we know this data is not entirely accurate because we're missing when we just didn't have time to enter things. And we know that's really important. So thank you for just reiterating for us that it is important for us to do those pieces. David? We can't hear you. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat. David's having trouble with his audio this morning, I know. Yeah. Um, why, I'm not sure. He's doing everything right, but. When you were um, at the very beginning of the meeting, Janine, we actually could hear David, but I don't think he could hear us. We were trying to tell him we could hear him. So um, I don't know if that helps at all. So one of the things that Brandy said at the beginning is um, about the data and the telling the story. So that is something we're really working on. So as you think about what you heard today, um, if there's something that really you know, kind of resonates for you. We want to make sure that um, that we're telling a story that really does reflect the work and reflect what people need and what we're able to provide. So if something strikes you as you think about what, again, what you heard, let, let me know um, because we, we don't want to just spew out numbers. We, we really want to paint the story and we're working with our marketing person around this and, um, you know, trying to be accurate as well as compelling um, about what it is that we do. So please feel free to follow up with me and um, the team and I will, will figure that out and weave that in. And um, just a huge appreciation, Brandy and, and Amy are kind of our numbers people. Amy tracks the, all the finances and Brandy has really been working with our case management um, vendor to make sure our data is what, what, what actually is happening. It's been great to have Melinda on board and now our data we can separate from LHA and non-LHA. Um, and Melinda has been super helpful and we also have some reporting we have to do for the LHA side that's a little bit unique. <laughs> Um, so we're doing that. And um, I'm sorry, Veronica and Melissa uh, weren't able to be here, but they're meeting with folks. So um, looks like Brandy um, or Amy or Melinda, you want to, David's got some questions in the chat around looks like more like demographic kinds of things. So maybe if one of you <coughs> would like to look at the chat and respond. So that goes back to Art's question about like, can we pull data by how many people are Spanish speakers? And, and the answer is yes. We just have to ask our um, case management system folks to create reports that pull that. And we have to make sure we're entering all of that. So some of those questions about demographics, um, you know, we don't ask those questions all the time, unless there's a reason we need to, right? If we're helping somebody fill out paperwork where they have to fill in that demographic info, um, we do ask for phone numbers so we can contact people, but uh, we ask if they live in Longmont, but we don't always get their address unless there's a reason why we would get that. So it's it's missing some pieces. It's a little bit easier in the LHA properties because we know already, you know, there's income qualifications and age, so. It's easier for, for my statistics to kind of pull that out. And Bruce, we're de definitely 
changed up some of our demographic questions so that they are inclusive and appropriate in a world of 2022. So, um, oh, it's been good to be able to change up some of the how we ask those questions as well. Ruth, did you have a question? Yeah, you said that one of the major uh, concerns that present themselves for counseling was mental health. And so much, I think what you do is preventing issues and disasters. And I think people like to see statistics also in a way that, I mean, that's hard to document prevention, but that's what you're really doing. That's, that's why we capture that data about how many people did we help maintain their housing before they got an eviction notice. It's, that's, that's where we're trying to capture some prevention. Yeah, you really are. And one of the things that we're working toward, and I'm going to say this in a minimal, minimal way, is with our county area agency on aging and starting to look at how we better collect outcome data. Like what difference did you make? Which is I think a, not exactly prevention, which I, I totally agree with you, Ruth, but also what difference did you make? Um, and so we have, uh, Brandy and I have been a part of a team with the Area Agency on Aging so that we can start to align a few of our data points so that we can start to really look at um, the outcome, the, the, what, what, what did it matter? Um, kind of thing. And so um, it's a great question. And I'm just going to say, keep asking us because I think that's the future. We really need to do a better job about being able to document the outcome. And the outcome, uh, which Brandy gave the example, is a good one. And, and I will say, I did not pull a report, but we can, on uh, our closing evaluations when people do have counseling, which is optional. But our return rate is pretty good. Uh, we almost never have someone say that counseling wasn't helpful and that they would not recommend it to someone else that they know. Um, the feedback is really overwhelmingly positive. When people work with our peer support volunteers, our intern, when they go to support groups, we do offer that follow-up evaluation to see, did this make a difference? And I wish there was a way to capture, um, this is one of my favorite stories. And uh, we used, uh, we had a, a, a gentleman, a monolingual Spanish speaker gentleman who needed teeth, uh, needed some significant dental work. And after he got it, he came in and I think so, a couple of us were in tears um, because he was so appreciative that he could go out. He was comfortable visiting with people and he was eating again. And, um, you know, how do you collect that? Uh, you know, that, that was an outcome that made an incredible difference in his social and nutritional and health life. <laughs> um, but uh, so we're very fortunate. We get folks who express their appreciation in different ways. And when he walked in here smiling ear to ear, it was one of those moments that, uh, that I will hold for sure. So since we have a lot to cover, I think we should move on. And Brandy and Amy, thank you. And Melinda for all the information you've given to us. Prudence has joined us so she can take over taking the minutes. Sheila did that for you, you in the beginning. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now um, we're I, going to, what? Can I just something? So there was a conversation about how to measure outcomes. Was that correct? So one of the things, um, I'm a case manager, um, you know, cause I'm a nurse. Um, well, I'm certified in it, but one of the things that, that we do, because the, the value is how do you prove a negative almost? Because uh, that's, that's what you're really looking at. And one of the things is that what, I'm not sure whether this will work, but there's, there's projections you can use, like how many people would have been homeless? So you have a base number, let's say, 5% of your population in Longmont is going to be homeless. So that equals X amount of people. 
And then you say, um, out of those X amount of people, X reached out to the senior center and X got housing or housing assistance. That's one way you could do it. It, it entails a lot more um, work. So um, it's just like, okay, they got, I'll give you an example. They got home health care. 10 people were eligible, eight of them went. So 80% of them did not return to the hospital. So that's kind of how we do it. Thank okay, you. That's it. And then okay. I'll start taking minutes. Where are we on the agenda? We're on the position update on old business. Okay. So um, just a quick, um, we um, just posted the senior clinician two, which is our counselor position. It got posted yesterday. It is posted until filled. So um, that is out there. Um, and we're still on hold for our afternoon evening custodian, but that will be our next position that we'll uh, re-up. So Art, I've got your name down next to that to help and I believe uh, David and someone else had offered to help with the counseling position. So Brandy's kind of taking the lead on that and um, we'll follow up with you because we have those notes at, uh, as when we get ready to do the interview uh, for the, the counselor position. So that's uh, our position update. Okay. And then we have the 2021 annual report discussion. So do you want it? Sheila? Sheila, you're muted. Yes, I'll be muted during this next um, piece of the agenda because I confess that Prudence did it all and just informed me. And um, <laughs> That's because she was away. <laughs> yes, but still. So the good, the bad, and the ugly is, is, is Prudence. <laughs> Okay, Prudence, take it away. <laughs> okay, so th this is what I thought. Um, I think um, there is, so I only saw two slides that pertain to senior advisory in the, I think there's 16 pages. So I concentrate on those two because the other part of it is about, and, and actually I think these could be trimmed down, but I, not to say so, um, was about COVID. Because if you really think of 2021, COVID, you know, once people started getting vaccinated in February, that changed the whole thing. I mean, I still think we did a lot. I'm not sure whether it needed three slides. However, I also understand that it may be something we want to keep in three slides. So that's, that's one thing. There's also a bunch of statistical information, which I know Michelle has. So I left that, those blank. I X'd them out. Um, and that goes back to what you were discussing before about outcomes, how to really show that. Because to say I saw X, you know, I think it's it's important. Um, in the future, you may want to think differently about it as you as you struggle, and I'll use the word struggle to reflect outcomes. So, <clears throat> I, when looking at the last slides. Um, they had four, um, four accomplishments. So I kept it to four. <laughs> um, and I put in a slide about what we need from the city council. Okay. Um, and Julie's going to shake her head. Yes, the RFP for the foot care. <laughs> I mean, I have never seen, I, but I've just dealt with, with something else with purchasing there. I'm not sure whether we should farm the whole process out because it seems like the city is unable 
and does not have the bandwidth to take a look <laughs> at an RFP for foot care without adding 15 other things. This seems, um, it seems it should not take over a year to get the foot care mm -hmm. process going. It, in my mind, it should have been a go as soon as we, we open to attract more people. So that's, that's my two cents. I put down that we met with Carmen. I thought that was very, I wasn't at that meeting, but I thought that was very important work that we did. Um, I also noted that we met with the transportation person and the, um, let me not forget everybody's favorite, the web track. Um, <laughs> so we met with those four people. However, in the next slide, I say, city council, we need support to accomplish these things. Meeting with people is all fine and good. However, and having them back to tell us they haven't done anything is not all fine and good, unless it's fine and good for everybody else. But, you know, crossing the street, you know, on Main Street and other areas is very important to the Senior Advisory Council. He came and talked. Okay, I realize government moves slow. However, um, my hair cutter was here yesterday. He lives near there. And she said that she has seen three people get hit in their wheelchairs. So I said to her, if they died, they'd probably fix it, but they didn't. Um, <laughs> So I just put in two slides, one, what we did during the year and what we need from city council help. I thought that on the whole, I thought that 2021 was well put together. Um, I would definitely change the pictures to reflect younger seniors, so that there should be a mixture of those people younger, so 55 to 70, then another slides with people who are 75 and over. Um, because looking at it, I have to tell you, I was like, oh my gosh, these people are really old. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody on here looks so healthy and young that <laughs> I have to say it was like, I was, a little taken back and I didn't remember it from last year. So those were my two slides that I put in and I sent them in sh to sh Sheila. Um, and that was that. So feedback is always welcome. Michelle, if you have feedback, I know that you'll put in the statistics, um, which I know at the not the last meeting, but the meeting before they went out, but they were not supposed to come to us. I think they were supposed to be discussed with Brandy's team first, and they've done a tremendous job, you know, in really um, helping people sort their way. Questions, comment, changes you would like to see? City Councilwoman, please. <laughs> You're muted. I know sometimes my space bar unmutes me and sometimes it refuses to. <laughs> this is almost an aside. I would kind of emphasize the, um, the walk light programming issue a little bit. The reason being that although he, uh, I, I think it was Tyler who came and spoke to right, him. Tyler. And uh, he is going to Fort Collins uh, with a promotion. So, you know, it's good for him. And overall, he has been incredibly responsible and responsive um, to me as a city council member representing people. But he is not a creative, imaginative person. And, and so he does sometimes have or a hard time getting outside the book um, and, and emphasize 
realizing that this is not senior friendly the way our automated light systems are programmed. Um, you know, it might be something that the next guy could run with trying to prove himself. So let's make sure that one doesn't get lost in the dust. And, and I also think Marsha and, and Janine brought this up in the meeting is that it's not only seniors, it's also um, parents with children. Absolutely Especially right. between Third and Main Street. Mm -hmm. They really, I mean, I've seen parents pick up the stroller <laughs> with the kid in it and dash. Yes. Um, it's, it's really kind of amazing to me because in other areas of the city, you know, that is a 15 second light, 15, 15, 14, 13. Other areas of the city along Ken Pratt, they're longer. And you know, they're trying to optimize the traffic and, and reduce waiting, you know, lights cycling. Sure. And, and that's part of the problem. But, you know, we might want to make the point that if downtown were more walkable, that few more people would choose not to drive there, but, but you know, make take one public transit and stay there a long time rather than just zipping down. And, um, you know, it's another case for, for uh, again, I guess making the lights more mobility friendly or, or um, you know, something. Because uh, you're right, young people as, as well as seniors. <laughs> this issue, <laughs> young parents do. And cyclists, because of because of dis, the dismount rules, you know, they're walking their bikes, so it's awkward for them to. Yeah, David should wrote that there should be more graphs rather than words. Um, and Michelle, if you need a hand in converting the numbers to graphs in Excel, I can certainly. Um, assist you, and I bet you David could too. I sometimes wonder when um, contemplating all of this, um, what number of people that are driving through the cities, uh, especially driving down Main Street, are using that as a thoroughfare versus people that are actually <clears throat> navigating downtown businesses. Mm. Because I think that in taking everything into consideration, one needs to take a look at that. Um, and I think, I know of myself and certainly my sense is a majority of the traffic that needs to get going and get through is using Main Street as a thoroughfare. It's not because they're uh, giving business to the uh, to the companies on the street, uh, whereas the foot traffic is basically there for a different reason. And I think that needs to be considered. Uh, this is Michelle, you know, um, Prudence, I would, um, and I, and if I didn't say this clear enough throughout the last several months, let me be really perfectly clear. The foot care RFP delay is pretty much 100% on me because it was not my priority um, for moving that forward. And so when I got back in touch with purchasing at the first of descent, uh, first of February, um, my contact in purchasing has moved it right along and it should be released by the end of this week, uh, according to her. So I just really want to be clear that's on me um, and not on anyone else. So. so Michelle, wait a second. We can take that out and I'm perfectly happy to do that if, if that's or you can add that the senior services manager is slow as molasses. <laughs> right, no, no. But no, seriously, seriously. 
However, if, if I heard you correctly, in February of 21, is that correct, or is it February of 22? Oh, no, I, I finally took it off my back burner February of 2022 and, and re, relit it because it's been sitting with me. It just was not a priority for me. And, oh, okay. and okay. I purchasing, purchasing has responded really well. So okay. it, it should go out the end of this week. Okay, so I can take, I can, we can delete that bullet. Or, or, or thrash me, it, either way. No, no, I, I think we should delete that bullet. <laughs> I, no, no, I mean, that, that's okay. That, that I'm com uh, maybe, is everybody else comfortable with that? I'm pretty comfortable in deleting it. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not a, a big deal. You know, the other question I had, and I should have asked this a long time ago, I have never understood, and my fellow board members can educate me, as why we are involved with the Longmont Housing Authority. Susan's smiling, so she may know. Well, I well there's a lot of seniors in Longmont Housing. Yes. Six, okay. of the, six of the nine properties are for older adults. And through the funding of those properties, um, they can use that funding to hire uh, resource people, resident services, it might be called a resource specialist. Because we already had a team of resource folks here and because the majority of the properties right now are older adults, it made sense to put that person in that position under senior services. Okay. And I advocated for that um, because I think those folks need a team. So Melinda is definitely a part of our team. Um, and she also gets extra support from Brandy regarding anybody who has behavioral health issues. So, um, mm -hmm. We're working out kinks, you know, it's not a perfect alignment, but I think it makes good sense. So the city general fund is not paying for that position. That's actually funded through the housing authority, which is appropriate because that's where the funding comes, but it is housed, I think appropriately. And, okay. um, and it's been good. That's my feeling. And I don't know if Marsha would want to add anything else as a housing authority board of commissioner Go ahead, Marsha. Yeah, I, I would, in fact, because, in fact, it was a stroke of genius and a lifesaver to share resources with the LHA in the way that the Senior Center has done. Um, the, this is a, a nationwide trend that between the way HUD has been working, especially during the previous administration, uh, but also many previous administrations, uh, and and now that housing authorities reach this inflection point where they kind of crash and burn, and ours did that, and right. you know could not sustain itself, and the city of Longmont came in and with a truly heroic effort rescued it, and if uh, our different agencies and most especially the senior center had not been willing to step up and had been resistant to that, it would not have succeeded. So, you know, maybe we can, um, we can hope that uh, the senior center might get resources back. In fact, it already is, right? You know, thank you for three new case managers, but, um, but it had to happen. And uh, the, even, even in the, the, um, properties that are not dedicated to retirees. Um, a majority of the residents are over age 55. And, and so the, the synergy is, is there. And in, it, it was, a, I can't emphasize enough, it was a lifesaver. So Michelle, thank, thank you, Marsha. So Michelle, what we may want to do is replace all the COVID stuff in the beginning <laughs> with <laughs> um, a, such good work that you did 
in recognizing the synergy between senior housing and the senior center and the accomplishments of the counseling people. And that way, that'll take away the RFP issue. <laughs> what did she do with her time? Yeah. Well, I can no, seriously, seriously, one slide on COVID. Um, and then I, I think that, that, you know, as Marsha and yourself explained to, to me, that um, I think that's a real accomplishment and that's something to be right. Like the survey you guys did there, I mean, that was really brilliant. And that should go in the PowerPoint because you, you did a great job. You surveyed, you got counselors for them, you know, the move in and the move out with, you know, redoing it. That took a tremendous amount of work. Moving on, are we ready? Yep. So we're on D, goals for 2022. I, th I thought we kind of came up with that last meeting, but it's here to talk about again. Um, can, can I just suggest that we, I didn't update the goals that on the agenda. So maybe this is best served for April, Susan. And that's what I was thinking. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not up to date. So I need to okay. fix it. Put that for April. Coffee with the council. We, who was volunteering? I was on the 26th. Julie was. Janine was. And we are we are definitely on for that. And I found out um, that we can also have some baked goods now. So I will make sure that not only we have coffee, but we have something else um, that morning. And I will plan to be here probably between 8 and 8.30. Uh, the building okay. will be open. I don't know where I read that it was going to be by Zoom. Maybe it was an older publication, but I wanted to verify that it is going to be live yeah. and at the Senior Center, right? 8.30, March 26th it on is my March calendar. 26th. Yes, okay. live and in person. All right. And I know that it says old business other. Does anybody have any old business other stuff? Before we give the floor to Francie and Lisa, I would just like to make a motion that we meet in person next month so we don't have to keep resending Zoom invitations. So that's my motion. Does anybody have a discussion or a Second. disagreement? Second. Prudent seconds carried. We're meeting in person at the Senior Center April 6th. 10 a.m. Yay. So. I just wanted to make sure with Michelle, uh, a mandate had come down from the city manager about meeting Zoom-wise. Is it okay to do that now? It is. And actually, Marcia could speak to this, but city council has also voted to go back. And I did get direction that it was to bring it back up to the board and let the board make the decision. So this is perfect. Board has decided. So now we can welcome Francie and Lisa for their presentation. Uh, thank you for having us uh, today. Um, President of the board and the rest of the board, my name is uh, Francie Jaffe. I'm the water conservation and sustainability specialist. Uh, even though my job starts with water, I'm actually talking about waste today. Um, I'm also joined um, um, uh, with uh, Lisa Knobloch, uh, the sustainability program manager, uh, so um, who will be supporting in, us in this conversation. We, so I have a presentation that I will share. Okay, hopefully I shared the right screen there. Um, 
So today we're talking about the zero waste resolution update and universal recycling ordinance. Um, we are usually uh, we're working very closely with uh, Charles Caminitas, our waste services manager. Uh, usually he would probably join us in one of these meetings. He's out of town for the next two weeks. Uh, so, but if at the end, if we have questions that we're unable to answer, um, Charlie is always happy to answer, but it might take him a little bit of time since I think he is back in town uh, in mid-March. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going, I have maybe about a five to six minute presentation to give you all some context. And then we want to spend the most of our 20 minutes uh, today to have, we have a discussion question that we would like uh, to ask you all to get some guidance on uh, some direction as we work on these two efforts. And then we'll end with um, some kind of timelines and next steps and how to, to get involved beyond uh, this, this meeting. So just to quickly highlight, um, trash impacts our community in different ways, uh, whether that's litter, pollution, uh, contamination of our soil and water, and it can also um, impact our greenhouse gas emissions. So the city has a history of trying to reduce trash in our community. Uh, in 1990, we began recycling. In 2008, we actually passed our first zero waste resolution. Uh, that set uh, guidance and um, uh, for the city. In 2017, if you are in a, a single or, or duplex family home, uh, we started the pay as you throw as well as curbside composting. Uh, last year, uh, we are trying to expand our hard to recycle events so we are our, our just ability to do hard work to recycle. So we actually had our first event last year. And then this year we're doing an update to our zero waste resolution and, and drafting a universal recycling ordinance that will be presented to council. So just to uh, talk a little bit about the difference between those two, uh, the resolution will really set our commitments. I will be talking a little bit later about targets. Our first resolution did not include targets. We have some from our sustainability plan that passed in 2016, uh, but we are proposing um, based on council direction to look at our, our zero waste programs more extensively, more aggressive targets um, that I'll show later. And then in this resolution, um, once passed by council will really help guide staff moving forward with our zero waste programs. Uh, the ordinance really sets um, different things into law. Uh, specifically, a lot of ordinance focus on, uh, there's other communities have passed ordinance around uh, looking at multifamily and commercial. So right now, a lot of our programs are in the residential, but commercial, other commercial haulers serve our multifamily and commercial. So a zero, zero waste, our universal recycling ordinance uh, could start requiring recycling uh, citywide. It could apply to different sectors like commercial and multifamily complex complexes, and it could also be phased. So even if we pass it at the end of this year, the first year could be education focus and not starting to do that enforcement until later on. Uh, I've talked a lot about recycling. It could be in future years that we bring in composting or we do composting for certain sectors like restaurants. So we're really trying to figure out uh, the scope of what might be included in that ordinance. Uh, these are the guiding principles. They, these really tie back to trying to address those issues around trash that I highlighted earlier, that we want everyone to live in a clean and safe community, that we increase recycling and composting for all members of our community, and really acknowledging that reducing waste can help support the climate action goals that the city has set. So currently we have from our sustainability plan have a residential waste diversion goal of 50% by 2025. Last year, uh, we our residents diverted 42% of waste from the landfill. And then just to look a little bit more at composting, we have an opt-in program. So our recycling 
everyone has a recycling bin, why composting, you need to specifically request a compost bin. And we have about 24% participation. We, uh, a couple years ago in late 2020, we did a life cycle, uh, uh, a life cycle analysis to better look at our greenhouse gas emissions from waste. And in that uh, we had two proposed more aggressive targets for the city in our waste diversion that we are looking uh, at for this resolution update. Both of them start with in 2025, 50% of all sector waste diversion. I bolded that all because right now our goal is just residential and this would be all sectors. So it would include commercial and multifamily and construction and demolition. In the later years is where these uh, targets uh, diverge. The first one just has an 85% goal by 2050. The second one, that 85% goal is moved to 2035, but just for the residential and commercial sectors with 60% uh, for construction and demolition. Uh, construction and demolition is probably the hardest sector for us to increase uh, recycling in that sector. Just, and it has a lot to do with current infrastructure that exists, but there's a lot of uh, regional efforts trying to figure out how to address that sector. But that's why it, it splits that goal at 2035 and then 2050, a more ambitious target of 95% of all sector a waste diversion. So just to kind of summarize what I just said, uh, our main goals is that we want to set more ambitious goals for the residential, commercial, and multifamily sectors. Uh, right now for the universal recycling ordinance, at a minimum, we're looking at requiring recycling for commercial and multifamily and residential. In the future, uh, we're thinking, we're starting to think about what, where does composting come in? Where does construction and demolition come in? So we're really at the, the early process of developing our zero waste resolution and the ordinance and are engaging um, you all and other members of our community to really help us draft uh, the resolution in, the, in these items. So our main question that we'd like to discuss with you today, uh, with these increased targets that are much more ambitious than our current targets, what are specific considerations for older adults? Uh, we started to think about uh, what if someone was living alone and didn't need those big recycling and big composting carts? Uh, what if someone was living in a multifamily building? Um, uh, what are different considerations to factor in, thinking about different places that you frequent in the community, and also uh, what access and education would be needed to help us achieve these targets. So I can, I can either leave the question up if that's helpful, or I could drop it in the chat and then stop sharing my screen so it's a little bit more uh, conversational. Yes, Council Member Martin. Um, Francie, I... I just wanted to, I don't know where, where you'd put it under these topics, but for the, the people that this board represents in particular, um, many live in multifamily uh, uh, settings and all are, if, if they get a utility bill at all, are really concerned with the magnitude of that bill. So, um, we would like to understand for the different programs, uh, you know, in, in the 85% composting version, for example, is that gonna be mostly paid by businesses or whatever? Uh, and, and also, you know, are there gonna continue to be options that allow people to keep their fees low, like pay as you throw, you know, um, if, you, if you use every other week, uh, landfill diversion with the small bin, then it pays for your composting opt-in, for example. Um, and, and I think those things are going to be really important. So I would just like to explicitly introduce those two items to the discussion. Uh, I'll just jump in really quickly. Thanks, Council Member Martin. As Francie mentioned, I, I know a lot of you, but if, if I haven't met you before, I'm uh, Lisa Knobloch, the Sustainability Program Manager. And part of this process will also be doing 
data analysis. So looking at those two different scenario target scenarios that Francie talked about and doing a, a cost benefit analysis of what policies or programs would we need to put in place to meet those different scenarios and what would the cost be so that we can have a really informed discussion around, you know, what are those cost implications and where might the, the revenue need to come from in order for us to make sure that as you're saying, Council Member Martin, that that those costs don't un, unduly burden different folks in our community. So we don't have that information yet, but that's part of this process for us to learn that. And France will be chatting about this in a minute, but, but we also want to come back to this group before we take a final resolution to council so that you all can see whatever is in there and make sure that we didn't, um, you know, miss anything or accidentally put anything in there that might have some sort of unintended consequence to that effect. But thank you so much for bringing that up. That's definitely, and that's a, that's a comment we're hearing from, from a lot of folks as well. Um, you know, everybody's getting squeezed and we know utility rates are going up and, and we want to be mindful of that. Prudence? Um, so do we know what the barriers are to composting? Uh, we can speak to a few, but that's definitely some of the feedback we would love to hear from you all with regards specifically to older adults. So currently the, our curbside composting program, as Francie mentioned, is only available for uh, folks that are served by yeah. the city services. So that's single family homes or um, mm -hmm. multifamily, multifamily complex, complexes up to eight units that opt into our service. So not all of those multifamily units do. So just access in general. So folks that, you know, live in a multifamily complex and the property owner, property manager doesn't, you know, subscribe to recycling or composting service, obviously that access piece is a lot harder for folks. And then there definitely is still an education component, you know, that we're trying to work with folks on, you know, what is compostable, what are the items that you can put in versus, you know, what are the items that might go in a recycling bin. Um, you know, dispelling some of those uh, fears or concerns about, you know, people keeping a compost bin in their home and there might be smell or bugs or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, those are kind of the main barriers that we know. Of. The other thing, and this is something that we'll look at in that co cost um, analysis that I just talked about, is the current composting facility where our city compost goes is in Keensburg, which is pretty far away. And so, the costs associated with the that transport and everything is pretty high, especially compared to recycling and, and just landfilling. Um, and so that's part of what we, we really need to look at is if there's not a closer facility, and I know that's some conversation that regionally is happening, um, that still could be a considerable barrier. Janine? I have a question in terms of certainly as a senior cost and rising cost of uh, services in general is a consideration. But I also wonder if, if you know, Longmont Housing Authority, if their facilities do composting, if they do recycle. And, and trash bins, uh, and if they are not currently doing it, if they, if perhaps it could be done at one or two or three of those facilities to assess the actual price. Uh, and, and not only that, but how many people would participate in the program? Yeah, that's a great thought. Thanks, Janine. Uh, David messaged. Wait, I have to look at his message again. I'm going to, Prudence, I'm oh. going to dovetail on what David has to say. Okay. Um, he's talking about um, mobility um, and what kind of issues, you know, they might have. So um, I know that was one thing that I wanted to mention was, you know, the, the bins at the, the size that they are now currently, um, you know, with a recycling bin, even though it's recycling and it's empty containers, those, those containers can be very cumbersome for seniors to get to the curbside. And so I think that there needs to be some conversation around 
potentially redesigning those in the sense that for seniors, they have a different design that's a, a little bit easier for them to use. Maybe it's smaller. However, if we go smaller, then it makes sense to rate that financially, you know, accordingly. And Lisa, I don't know, do you and Francie get out to actually see some of the multifamily dwellings? I'm extending an invitation. You can come to Southwest Longmont and see 200 condo units and see what we're up against with recycling. Anytime, be glad to show you, but I don't see how it's gonna work here. Actually, some people have tried it and uh, Charlie said, oh, that's not gonna work. And so they had gotten a re, uh, compostable bin and they took it away, even though we have city services here. Mm. And is that largely just Susan? I but I think we'd love to take you up on that. Up on that, I think that'd be really helpful. Anytime um, you let can, me know. Yeah, we can connect with you. Um, I'd love to know: is that is that mostly just space issues or education issues, or, or kind of what were both. the same things? That, both. Okay. Um, I just want to add in, and it may have changed, and I apologize if I've not got current information, but I think the LHA properties have a contract for waste, and I, I don't know if the city is even picking up uh, waste stuff. What I remember when I was in and out of the facilities more um, a year ago was there was no recycle or compost bins anywhere in the properties, but that could have changed. And so we have a meeting on Friday, Lisa and, and Francie, and I'll just kind of raise that and try and update myself on where we're at with that. Um, th the other piece that has sort of emerged, and this is across the community, not just in the LHA properties, is how we help older adults get rid of large items or items they cannot physically manage. So we actually help with some of that in terms of the cost, but um, at some point, I think that larger item or too difficult, cumbersome, heavy to move, um, I don't know where those items fit into a waste removal plan, but happy to talk to you about that at, a, at another time. Lisa, did you say we're transporting our compost to Kingsburg? Is that correct? Yeah. So it doesn't seem worth it to compost financially. That's kind of what I'm hearing. Is that correct? It, it is definitely a big cost barrier right now where it right. is. Like I said, there are conversations regionally to try to um, get a composting facility closer. Um, I don't know where those conversations are at or at what point in the future that might come, but that, that definitely is a consideration. So what some now. cities do, and, and you're probably aware of this, is that they get the public to compost if they give them free mulch. So that is a big for people who mulch, that's a big come on. Oh, we'll give you free mulch. And then the city uses the compost to mulch instead of buying um, mulch. So that it's a cost savings for the city and it's an, an, an inducement for people to get mulch from the cities. Thank you for that suggestion. I also wanted to add, add to your to your first question about the, the cost. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight our pay as you throw rates are set up. If you are if you're adding a compost bin and are able to uh, decrease your trash size because of that, that is that is more it does make more financial sense to have a compost bin recycling bin in a smaller trash bin. So we do try to incentivize in that way at this time.
I just wanted to put out there, um, Prudence, that you know, at, down at the recycling center, you can actually go and pick up um, city mulch. It's the all the yard waste that's been been um, processed, and then they dump it there so that folks can go go get that for free. But I don't know if that includes the the composting aspect. I was shaking my head, but I'll also verbally say it. It does not include the composting aspect at this time. You know, Any other questions? Yes, I have Art? a question. In reference to uh, compost containers, uh, it, it appears, I mean, when I look at my neighborhood anyway on trash days, that there's very few people that have those uh, compost containers. And I'm just wondering if a little more education needed on that and, and letting them know what, you know, what is the result of, of uh, composting versus throwing in the trash or whatever. And I agree with cost too. I mean, uh, you know, I live here uh, uh, in Prairie Village and, and, and there are several seniors in this area and there's no, I mean, I can understand that they are, they are not going to, pay, what is it, $72 a year uh, to, to for a compost that they'll use where, where there's very minimal amount of uh, compost materials that are going to go in there other than during the summer months, of course. Janine? Well, I, I look at it in two different ways in terms of compost. Um, there is the compost scrap stuff that we use in cooking and preparing foods and things like that. And then the bigger compost, which is leaves and yard debris. And, and they're really very separate things. And you're right, Art, that the compost containers for uh, household compost are really quite small. And uh, even though they are sealed, when my neighbor put her, puts hers out, she has to uh, kind of protect against the animals that come. And I mean, they smell. There, there is reason why people aren't real anxious to do compost. And they wonder if this little, you know, pail of compost is really going to make a difference. Unlike the yard waste leaves compost, which that's a different issue. I, uh, the, the recommendation for education is definitely helpful. I, uh, well, I am also, I don't have the specific numbers off the top of my head from our life cycle analysis, but I'd be happy to uh, share some of the findings we had there that we did find that increasing recycling and composting um, can have a, um, significant in, uh, impacts on uh, um, increasing our avoided greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so just thinking from our kind of our greenhouse gas emissions standpoint, but I can uh, share some of that information with the board uh, after this meeting, if that is of interest. Yeah, you can probably send that to Michelle and she can send it on to us. That'd be great. Thank you, Francie. Any other questions or are we ready to tackle the next? Ah, Michelle. Just another thought, Francie and Lisa, to tuck this away, but I think that there are some opportunities within public works overall to look at how we support older adults. And I don't have a solution and I hate raising something without some thoughts in mind, but whether it's getting your trash bin to the curb or your compost to the curb or um, in the winter, looking at how you get snow removed so you can take care of that. There are issues over the years with some older adults and individuals with varying level of ability, physical abilities who can participate physically 
and some of those. And at some point, I think it's worth a chat um, ab about how do, how do we find out who those individuals are who would want to participate but may need some additional support to do that? And what's the role of senior services or somebody else in making that happen? So um, as an example, um, when my mother was living independently, she could no longer get her trash bins to the curb, but her neighbors did that. Her neighbors did her trash and her neighbors did her compost, or not compost, uh, recycle every other week. And we are looking um, at working more with community and neighborhood resources and talking about some neighbor to neighbor connections. But I think there's some opportunity there to really look at how we support people participating because the desire might be there, but the physical ability may be uh, challenged and it may be even particularly challenging during the winter weather. So just a plan. Seed plan. Yeah, thanks so much, Michelle. I, I, I appreciate that. And I think that would be worth a conversation. We, we work closely with the community and neighborhood resources. And this year are actually expanding a position to have a, a full-time neighborhood sustainability position housed in community and neighborhood resources. So I think sitting down with us and, and Carmen and Wayne, you know, at, at some point in the not too distant future, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And then and then I do think, you know, I, if there needs to be or is opportunity for some other conversations with some of our PWNR folks, you know, on the operation side, we can sit down with folks too to see if there's just some, some of that might be more than neighbor to neighbor stuff like you're talking about. But if there are some other, you know, small changes that we can make that help help people participate like you're saying that you know we can talk about that more. thanks anybody else francie yeah i just um if, if no one else has any comments i just had uh two more slide one just to to share with key dates as well as a couple ways to continue to uh stay involved in this effort that i can share So just really quickly, as Lisa mentioned earlier, we will return in May. Uh, we're aiming to have this zero waste resolution presented to council in June, and then have the universal recycling ordinance presented to council in December. I will drop this in the chat as well, um, but we recently launched Engage Longmont page. I also put my phone number, uh, the general sustainability email that both Lisa and I will receive, or if it's easier, um, feel uh, I think Michelle's always happy to take comments and then forward it on to uh, Lisa, Charlie, and I. So thank you so much for having us today, and we really appreciate your comments and ideas. Thank you. Thank you all. So we can move on to the revisit ordinance change request, Michelle. Yeah, this is just a day for Michelle to reflect on all of the things she has not done or done well. So, COVID, well, the board had made a decision to revisit our ordinance and increase our board membership from seven to nine. Um, and that absolutely took a way back burner during COVID. Um, so it's time to revisit. This is some new players on this board, um, but this was a decision to really address the fact that the board at that time did not really think the alternate position was the way to go, that rather than seven plus an alternate, we should just go to nine. So um, I sent you out a copy of the current language. It's really just one change, which would be the board shall consist of nine members versus seven. Right now, the language is a majority of whom will be at least 55 years of age and residents of the city is an overall requirement. So what I need to know from this board is do you want to pursue that? And then um, this does require going to council. It's a charter. There's change. It's um, and, and that's fine, we can do that. I just need to get it in the hopper <laughs> um, and move this forward. So um, thoughts, questions? 
and we would eliminate the alternate. Sheila. You're muted. Just one question, and it's, it's really one word, and it's why. The board at the time had thought that that would address the alt, we just would no longer have an alternate position. Do we have to have an alternate position? No. Well, at the time we got it, we did. Marcia, do you want to jump in here at any point? <laughs> I'm so happy to, uh, boards can set their own um, their own rules. It actually came up, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, as part of a discussion. Um, I do remember those stupid five minute interviews that got you appointed. To this board. <laughs> and the, the real discussion was have the council interview fewer people and have the um, the boards have a bigger part in, in nominating board members themselves. And there's a lot of dissent on council about whether that's a good or a bad thing, but everybody agrees that the five minute interviews are kind of insulting given that the people who apply are usually pillars of the community and deserve more. Um, so, you know, the, the answer is that, uh, you can decide what would make the best board for yourself. And everybody really does recognize that this is, uh, you know, one of the most competent boards that we have in the city and there's a lot of trust. So, uh, you know, do what you think you should. Um, you will be doing something more ab about recruiting and recommending than you are doing now. And while I've got the floor, I have to leave 15 minutes early. So if we have other, if you have other questions you'd like to ask me as a council member, um, we should do that soon. Um, next week's council meeting has a lot of stuff about LHA on it. If you'd like to, you know, if you're following that, um, but nothing, other, nothing that uh, other than that um, that's particularly relevant to this board. Michelle, quick question. So you're saying with the audience or ordinance, you have to put it together and then go to city council. Can it be sent to city council and then city council just votes by email? I mean, this is, you know, to take up your time trudging downtown when it could just be an email vote. So I think the, the package is that whole section on composition. You have two choices of board. You can keep it at seven. You can make it 25. I mean, the number of board members, you could make your recommendation. The second paragraph we would ask to be eliminated based on the prior board's choice is there would be no more alternate. Right. So it is about getting it on the council agenda as an ordinance change, and they would just vote at a council meeting. They have to do it at a council meeting. They can't do it by email because it's an ordinance. Dad, I, you know, <laughs> I think the council probably needs to relook at that. I mean, you can vote for things, important things by email. Uh, so that, that I'll leave to, to Marsha to think about. <laughs> so at this, at this point, it's an ordinance change and I have to get it on the council agenda. And I really just need to know, and you all, it would be helpful to have a motion. Do you want to remove the alternate par the paragraph regarding the alternate from the ordinance? Do you want to change the number of board members and what do you want that to be? So, Janine, yeah. okay. I, I don't particularly care about increasing numbers of board. The whole reason to eliminate the alternate was that it was basically a non-voting fill-in position. And most people that apply to the board want to be engaged. And that was the whole reason for this, not that it was felt we needed more people on the board, but that we did not feel that the alternate position 
was something that most people applying for boards really want to encourage them, let me say, uh, in the way we wanted them to be engaged. Because this was a prior board's direction, which I did not follow through on in a timely way, um, I would appreciate some new direction today. Tell me what you want me to do. And if you want me to make the change, I will start the process and, and make that happen. My motion that we make the change to nine members, that means we'd have a quorum of five and eliminate the second paragraph and just get this through and off the table. I second. I agree and second that. <laughs> Senior Hop for Michelle. You need a vote, Susan. Oh, all in favor? Sheila, you're not in favor? I'm you're... in favor of seven, not nine. Um... All right, so with simple majority favor? Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Democracy says we're going to nine. <laughs> okay. Okay, I will make it happen. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> and then we move on to the March or April resource fair in Lanyon Park. Interest. Yeah. yeah, so we'll be doing another resource fair in Lanyon Park for the Lanyon Park neighborhood. There are a couple of older adult communities up in that vicinity, as well as just in the community and neighborhood around. Um, if there are board members who are interested in being there and being um, outside uh, with us, we will have a senior services resource table there. And you can just put your name in the chat and I will get a hold of you. I don't have a date, but generally speaking, it will probably be later in April because it'll probably be like an afternoon, early evening, or it may end up being a Saturday um, so that we make sure we reach uh, folks who maybe have a typical work schedule. So if you're interested in being a part of that resource fair, please just put your name in the chat or email me and I will let you know when the date gets set. Okay, any other New business from anybody. So now we're on to the supervisor report. So um, I just want to make this really quick. I have a list uh, from the last Get Acquainted. If anyone is willing to make those calls, Susan, I'll scan it and send it to you. Thank you. There is seven people. So you, can you do seven? You go okay with seven? If nobody else wants to join me, I'll do seven. Okay. Um, the second thing is um, we had talked about changing the name of the senior center. I talked to Erica, our um, marketing person, and have tentatively invited her to the April advisory board meeting to start talking about that um, interest in uh, what a name for the senior center might be. She and I talked about the possibility of um, maybe contacting one of the local universities um, marketing and communications departments to see if an intern might want to take it on as a research project. We talked about possibly hiring a consultant, um, some different options. So I think she is um, interested and excited to come to the April board meeting if you want me to put her on the agenda for that first discussion about the name. So show our hands. Yes. 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 Okay. Any nays? Shout out a nay. Okay. No nays. No nays. And then um, just the last thing is um, I have officially put in my letter of retirement and um, June 3rd is the date I have selected. So um, just to let you all know that and um, that's where I'm headed.
I think that's it for me. I know we're short on time. You'll love retirement. <laughs> Janine, we can move on to you if you have anything for us. Um, I will try to go very quickly. Um, the area on aging um, met on uh, Friday the 4th, just a couple of days after we met. Uh, we discussed issues that are coming up from them uh, and some recommendations. They're looking at developing what they call a Cupid crew uh, for uh, supporting people that are isolated, discussed uh, how they need to uh, recruit some volunteers um, uh, for that project. And they have developed a website if anybody is interested in pursuing that. Uh, there was quite a bit of discussion about uh, the Marshall Fire and uh, how they were assisting people, certainly by trying to get Medicare um, cards for them and Medicaid cards for them. Uh, they uh, had over $5 million that was um, donated and distributed. And uh, they're starting to look at, uh, as a result of those fires, emergency response uh, for, uh, especially for seniors, uh, in any area. Um, also uh, addressed issues with elder rights and uh, developing an ombudsman program uh, that would uh, be independent of a, an assisted living or a nursing home to uh, work as an advocate for complaints by both um, residents and their families. Um, there was discussion uh, about um, bills that are currently being considered uh, and uh, one that probably won't be passed but was offering uh, $500 to people over the age of 55 to rent out their homes. Uh, this creates major concern because of um, people being taken advantage of and also safety issues in and around a program like this. And once you bring people in your home, how do you get them out? So they were hoping that this bill would not be passed. I'll know on Friday whether it was or was not. Uh, the other bill is a bipartisan bill uh, that wants to develop a commission on aging. It has some very fine goals. Uh, unfortunately, it could be in fact competing uh, for uh, services, efforts, and monies that are currently being given to um, the different counting area on aging. So much discussion went on about that and whether it should be supported in its, in its current form. Uh, so that's it for AAA. Moving on quickly to the friends. They, their new business discussed continuing magazine subscriptions for the front lobby and they agreed to sign a three-year contract. So we'll have those magazines that people seem to enjoy. The Sunshine Club, which provides funding for dental care for seniors, is withdrawing their funding and focusing now on children, which was the focus in the beginning. And the reason for that is they're not getting the income that they were and they think it's pandemic related. And then they have a new grant opportunity to get some funding through Fraser Meadows. And we'll know 
next month, whether or not that comes through. So that's the friends report. Art, anything for the Latino coalition? I uh, just like was saying, like they were saying earlier about uh, the numbers, uh, El Comité uh, had information that they are inundated with people that are uh, needing assistance with undocumented workers, but they're encouraging people, if you're looking at uh, working on citizenship, that you call it El Comité. Right now, or when they, at the last meeting, there were approximately 50 people on the waiting list and many more coming in on a regular basis. Uh, the other thing is Louis Lopez talked a lot about uh, El Cinco de Mayo. So glad that we're gonna do this after a couple of years. And I think as a, as a board, we should uh, consider putting a booth out uh, for that also. Uh, the other thing that Louis Chavez from, uh, from the school district said that there are about 1,200 students that were affected by the uh, Marshall fire. And if we know of anybody that, uh, you know, falls into this category if we have them called the district because they know there's still a lot more out there. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, there's a lot of places that are helping seniors with taxes, but I'm just wondering, Michelle, where are we at with that this year? Income taxes. Yep, we're doing them here and in person art and they're busy Tuesdays and Thursdays. We are following the national AARP guidelines so you do have to be masked uh, to get assistance from the income tax volunteers. Um, okay. Robin has put in the chat that our appointments are full or our appointments are full and we are on a waiting list, but we do have some information about some other uh, support that's out there. And while I have the mic, Art, if I could just add, Veronica has been in touch with Louis Lopez and I think senior services will definitely have a booth at Cinco de Mayo. I just don't have any information yet. So absolutely, if the board would like to participate in the Cinco de Mayo, a booth that we will have, um, I hopefully I'll know more, know more about it in April. So okay. we'll definitely have a presence. Thank you. And I believe that's all I have. Thanks, Art. Julie, anything from? Economic development, nothing, okay. <laughs> David can't talk, but we had a whole discussion on sustainability and engaging caring communities has not met. We will meet again next week and have an update next month. Can I just jump in real quick? Sure. Um, Michelle or, or Janine, who do I need to contact about the Longmont Economic Development Partnership and did we decide that that there's they're either getting a hold of me and that they're not that we're not uh, joining those meetings anymore or those meetings are quarterly. I think the last one or the next one is in May, and I did contact them and, and give them your name and number. Okay, All right. I did do that. Okay. Um, also, Susan, there, I, I did attend the sustainability meeting uh, in Dave's absence, and there were a, a few things that I would like people to be thinking about. Sure. Uh, the presentation was really focusing on uh, recycle and compost, but the electrification goals for the city are still proceeding very aggressively. There are some barriers that we all need to be thinking about. First and foremost is that they have their goals for 100% renewable energy by uh, 2030. However, when they did a survey, a majority of individual uh, people were not willing to convert what they had until whatever they use, be it a gas furnace or whatever, uh, breaks down and they have to actually get a new system. The other issue is that um, 
95% of, of use is uh, residential and only 5.3% is commercial at this time. I think they are working hard to change uh, the building code so that things like heat pumps have to be considered. Um, but it is important to note that <clears throat> as we learned with the fire, uh, that using heat pump systems to replace what's already in the home costs about twenty dollars to $25,000. So even with a rebate, a $7,000 rebate, these issues may in fact uh, become a barrier for being able to achieve what needs to be achieved in the time frame. Uh, that they want to achieve it. The other issue to be considered is that we currently get our energy from gas, wind, hydro, uh, and solar. And it's important in, in uh, electrification that we make sure that we actually have the ability to provide that electricity primarily with focus on wind and, um, and solar, because frankly, our water levels are going down and what's available with hydro as our drought conditions in the mountains increase really and truly need uh, to, to be considered and to be looked at. So is it realistic to believe that in eight years, um, we're going to become electrified? The answer is, in my opinion, no. But it's important that we all engage in this and we all seriously think about it in terms of what we can do and what we cannot do. You see, Louisville is going to roll back the green initiatives because the you know they estimated at less than five thousand where people are going out and getting bids and it's close to a hundred thousand for some things. Yep. I mean, it, it's a horrible thing that happened, but I think it has allowed all of us to really take a look at what potentially is doable and what is is less doable, or at least continue to have goals, but have them be you know, achievable goals over a reasonable period of time. Well, it's after 12. Do I have a motion to end the meeting? Motion to adjourn. Seconded by Sheila. Thank you, everybody.